It's freaking cold here in Fort Collins, and the news, at least on the roadside, is getting pretty thin. It's like we're in some sort of season where the riders are off. What's that? They had to go to the Caribbean? Tough life. Well, at least they get to join them in drinking at the office. About time I had a local beer on here. <laughs> Fortunately, cyclocross season has been delivering in spades. On a fast, grassy, twisting course at Super Prestige Rue de Forda, Telnet Fidea's Tom Meusa spent the last lap slowly eking out an advantage before throwing it away in 10 seconds in the sandpit, yet still holding off a large by cyclocross standards bunch in the sprint. Mathieu Vanderpool of BKCP Power Plus took second, and despite being well under the age of 23, he now leads the Elite Men's Super Prestige series. Alert viewers may have noticed this sign at Rue de Forda, saying, basically, Sven, straight or gay, take the solo win today. It's a reference to already denied rumors that the recently divorced Kralon AA drink rider has been in a relationship with a man, and a surprisingly progressive crowd statement from an event that frequently gets summarized in English as Belgian NASCAR. The sign did not reappear at an absurdly challenging Yamart cross, where Nice did indeed solo away, having the race well in hand by six laps to go. Enertherm BKCP's Sana Kant's win in the women's race was less dominant, perhaps because she had a mishap or two along the way. But the victory is her third straight after Rue de Forda in the European Championships the day before. Yeah, but road news. Uh... Wanna buy some replica movie bikes? Honestly, maybe we should call this interview season. We've got Mark Cavendish mellowing out, Dan Martin on staying positive, Chris Froome saying maybe he'll do the tour after all, and of course, Vincenzo Nibali. I like Nibali, but his answers on the tough questions, uh, they just sound like what he, and what more importantly, Vino has been saying since the second Iglinski positive broke. My work in the political sphere really makes me think that those are coached responses, especially the denial that anyone would think Vino's doping past is relevant today. The vibe of Astana discomfort resonates too with Janez Brajkovic, the recently signed United Healthcare writer who earlier this summer was begging to be back on the US race circuit. That is a very unusual sentiment from a guy who has been top 10 at the Tour de France. Nibali is pretty clear that he has his own unit within the Astana team, but Brajkovic makes me think that outside that, things are uh, not normal. And not like the doping not normal, but you know, like not well managed. And maybe a little of the doping not normal. I mean, clearly there's doping not normal going on there because of the positive tests, but can we just- Anyway, I got a Facebook comment the other day asking about the Brykovich transfer and what to think of UHC now that he's been signed. And I mean, yeah, it'd be crappy if Brykovich is, in the words of Matt Cook, a guy whose name we only know because of doping and he's taking rider spots from fully clean riders. But even Cook admits that ex-dopers can kind of be okay, giving George Hincapi grudging credit for starting a development team. And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the whole guilt by association thing. If riders from sketchy teams are always going to be assumed to be guilty, it sort of cuts into their incentives to stay clean. Plus, if you're really going to make the argument that group ethics are a thing, what does that say about Evelyn Stevens, who got her started a little squad called Layman Brothers? No dope scandals, but, you know, being the immediate catalyst for a nearly unprecedented worldwide financial catastrophe, kind of a bad thing. Then there's the fact that unlike bank executives, high-profile dopers eventually seem to get punished. Actually, parallels to conventional jobs come to mind a lot during transfer season. Much of the commentary on the UCI's revamped world tour structure, which is being finalized this week in Paris if they can find time between making FIFA jokes, is that a lot of riders might find themselves out of work. But the purpose of the Peloton isn't to provide employment. I mean, come on, Valentin Iglinski had a job because his brother won a bet. Fewer riders per team means that organizations simply don't have the roster space to do nonsense like that and still be successful. Plus, for all the perceived uncertainty of being a cyclist, Ted King's 2011 to 2014 run at various permutations of liquid gas Cannondale almost doubles my longest tenure at any employer. As for teams folding or losing sponsors, I mean, startups, small businesses, heck, entire industries collapse, sometimes with very little warning. Mergers like Garmin Cannondale or evolving business relationships like Specialized and Lululemon with Velocio and Bulls Dolmans are as familiar to corporate America as they are to European cycling. Now, none of this is to say that cycling is an easy job, just a job, and as susceptible to economic ebb and flow as any other. What better evidence of cycling's similarity to cubicle culture than that one weirdo who retires mid-career to pursue an almost certainly unprofitable venture? But despite his doping past, I'll be wishing Thomas Decker the best of luck in his hour record attempt next spring. I'm Cosmo Catalano, and that was The Week in Bike.